So this story didn't happen to me, but I heard it many times when I was growing up. My grandparents owned 80 acres about 20 miles east of Snowflake, Arizona. They had moved to the land in the early 80s after my grandfather had retired from the mine. The land was pretty barren and I really don't know why they chose to buy it. Red sandstone bluffs and dry washes cut across the landscape, dotted with juniper and cedar trees and just pretty much red sand everywhere. I suppose at the time that the land was cheap. They didn't have close neighbours though. The closest was about a mile away, which was my aunt and uncle. The next closest neighbour was a man named Stodard. I never got his first name, just Stodard. He lived about four miles away from my grandparents at the base of one of the sandstone bluffs, apparently. He was a just a terrible rancher, from what my grandparents said. He thought that he owned everything and was entitled to do whatever he wanted. More than once, my grandpa had caught him cutting my grandfather's barbed wire fence to let his cattle into my grandpa's land to graze. But anyway, long story short, this guy was just a jerk. Now, this area is actually full of ancient Anasazi ruins. Most of them have been destroyed by ranchers with backhoes trying to find pots to sell and whatnot. I'm sure Stodard was one of them, in fact. But the story goes that one day after losing a calf, Stodard stumbled upon a cave sealed by a giant slab of sandstone against one of the sides of the bluff. Curious about it, he used a backhoe to remove the boulder. After going inside, he discovers a burial cave and I'm sure that he was delighted. He starts taking things from the burial cave and selling them. And well, from that moment on, he just had some really terrible luck. At first, he lost about a half a million dollars in the stock market. Then his cattle all got diseased and died. He was pretty much in financial ruin and he gets another blow. His wife gets diagnosed with an extremely rare disease and dies. Then, Stodard gets thrown from his horse and loses his ability to walk. This all happens within a couple of years, mind you. He tells everyone that he knows that he's cursed from the burial ground. They all laugh it off, but Stodard puts all the artifacts back that he still has and seals the cave back up with the boulder. And then he simply abandons all his belongings and just up and leaves one night. This is in the late 1980s, but... Fast forward a couple of years since Stodart had been in his ranch house. The land and the house are bought by a man from California. He puts the ranch house up for rent. My aunt is pregnant with her first son and decides to move up to Snowflake to be closer to her parents. Stodart's house is actually fully furnished still and so my aunt and her husband move in. He finds a job working nights at the local paper mill and at first it seems like a, a nice little place. Creepy at night, admittedly, but not too bad. But then, weird stuff starts happening. For instance, my aunt starts hearing faint chanting and drums at night. She brushes it off. She had a hippie neighbor that lived about a mile away up on the bluff, so she figures that it must be one of them doing, well, hippie stuff. But she just can't help but feel like someone or something is always watching her all the time. She starts having terrible nightmares every night, but chalks it up to being alone and hormones and whatnot. She finally tells my grandpa about it, and he learns her his dog to keep her company at night. She drives the dog out there, but he just refuses to get out of the truck. The hair on his back is straight up, and he's growling now. She gets freaked out, but figures that maybe he saw a rabbit or something and hauls him into the house. The dog just stares at the door all night and growls. That night too, he growls and barks pretty much all night all throughout the house. The drums and the chanting are louder this time. And the next morning, my aunt finds human bare footprints around the house. This goes on for about a week too, and the dog barks and growls at night. Nightmares when she goes to sleep. Footprints in the morning. The chanting and the drums keep getting louder, and finally... Feeling like she's losing her mind, she asks my grandma to come over and stay the night with her. Grandma is more than happy to do this. After finishing her chores, she heads over, planning to make my aunt a nice meal. This is late in the afternoon. My aunt lays down for a nap, comfortable now that my grandma is there. My grandma decides to take a little walk at the base of the bluff. 
My grandma was actually a very religious person. She was very active in the church and devoted her life to Jesus. As she was out on her little walk, she likes to look for pottery shards or arrowheads and stuff like that. A little ways from the house, she gets a very unnerving feeling that something is watching her though. She said that it made her skin crawl and she could sense something evil. So my grandma prays and walks back to the house pleading the blood of Christ. She decides not to say anything to my aunt who is awake because she's already pretty frightened. But she tells my aunt that maybe it's a better idea to stay at grandma's house tonight. But my aunt eventually agrees. By the time my aunt gets her stuff together though, the sun is about to go down behind the bluff. Grandma, aunt and dog all load up in the pickup. Grandma turns the key and... Nothing. She tries again. Nothing. Not being very mechanically inclined, Grandma goes into the house to call Grandpa, but he doesn't answer. She remembers that he was going into town this afternoon, and dang. So they unload and go back into the house, waiting for Grandpa to get home. It's night time now, no moon, pitch dark. The dog begins its low growl again. The sounds of chanting and drums begin, faint at first but growing louder. My grandma begins to pray in between calling grandpa. But remember too that this is a time way before cell phones. And all of a sudden they hear something howl outside. Not a coyote howl, but something more ominous and large. And something is moving just beyond the reach of the porch light. Both women are beyond terrified at this point. And finally, after turbo dialing grandpa so many times, he answers. My grandma is absolutely frantic at this point and says, Elvin, something is outside of the house. You need to get here now. And for what seems like hours, though, they wait for grandpa's truck to come over the hill. Finally, they see the headlights. But before grandpa flies into the driveway, something runs across the road in front of him. His headlights illuminate an animal, something... A grandpa jumps out of the truck yelling for the women to get the hell in. He unloads a couple of shots in the general vicinity of this animal. They haul ass down the dirt road towards grandma's house. And my aunt, against her better judgment, looks back and she says that she sees red eyes watching them. The next day too, my grandpa and uncle head over to the house. Grandpa verified that all around the house there were bare footprints in the sand along with some really large coyote tracks. Needless to say, my aunt and grandma never went back to that house. My aunt won't even talk about it, in fact. I made the mistake of staying up too late one night and listening to the adults talk. My aunt actually moved in with my grandparents, but my grandma swears, though, that she would from time to time see those red eyes at night, just stalking the edge of her property. As far as I know, other people have tried living in Stodard's house, but leave within a month or two. That whole area just seems to be cursed or something. I've always hated going out there too, because it has just a sort of an oppressive evil feeling to it. Even at my grandparents too. I have more stories about this place involving other family members, but that'll have to wait for another time, because this is all I can muster up for now. But after researching and talking to some of my Native American friends, I'm fairly certain that my family members had the misfortune of running into a skinwalker. According to the Native Americans in the area, they frequent burials and graveyards allegedly, looting and desecrating the sites. They take pieces of the brains and the bodies and grind them into a corpse powder or something to use in their curses. They also are known to terrorize people away from areas like burials and ruins, which is apparently why they think that a skinwalker. I was 18 years old and worked in a more clothing store. I usually worked the night shift which meant leaving the store between 9 or 9.30 p.m. None of us really thought anything about calling out good night and walking out to our cars alone. Usually the parking lot was full of all the other workers leaving at the same time anyway. But on this particular night... I was in a great mood. 
I'd had a good evening at work and was going to meet up with my boyfriend when I got home, so I was just smiling and thinking to myself as I walked. When I got to the curb in front of the mall exit door to check for oncoming cars before I crossed over to where my car was parked, and it wasn't that far away, maybe 10 spaces from the front, I glanced up to verify where my car was, and I caught the eyes of a man sitting in his truck. He was wearing a cowboy hat pulled down lower over his eyes as though trying to conceal his face, but he was staring intently right at me. Of that much I was sure. I literally froze in place. I've never felt fear like I did in that moment. I snapped out of my trance though and I ran as fast as I could past his truck into my car which was only a few spaces away. This was before key fobs so I needed my keys to unlock the door. I always made fun of scary movies when the girl ran and sort of dropped the keys trying to get in, but it really does happen that way sometimes. I was shaking so badly that I couldn't even get the key in the door and then I dropped the damn things. But seconds later I was sitting in the car and shaking so badly that I just had to sit there a moment or two before I could drive off. He hadn't chased me, he didn't leave, but he did continue to just sit there. Later in the evening, after I had finally calmed down, I felt like an idiot, thinking that I must have gotten scared by somebody's husband picking up his wife after work or something. The next day, I went back to work, same night shift, and told everybody at work what had happened and how scared I had been. I sort of made fun of myself for being such a chicken, but I made sure that somebody walked out with me later that night. I stood at the door of the mall ready to run back in if I saw anything off, but... He wasn't there this time. I sort of exhaled and my friend and I went to our cars, relieved that everything was going to be okay. The following day at work, there was no talk of my fright from two nights ago and it was business as usual pretty much. About halfway into my shift, the manager walked up to me and said that she actually needed to speak with me. She turned around and walked up to the cop that I had not noticed was in the store now but curiously, I walked over and my manager wanted me to tell the cop about what had happened. I felt silly telling him for some reason because nothing had really happened. But when I finished telling him my story, he started asking questions about the truck. Did I know what model it was? Exact color? Did I know the year? I finally said something about how I didn't want to get anyone in trouble that I just freaked out a little bit and it was no big deal. But then the cop explained that the night before, one of the ladies leaving for the night had actually been kidnapped, driven around to the back of the mall into an unlit area, and was beaten and, well, you get the rest. I felt myself get lightheaded and my vision went back for a moment with it dawning on me that I had actually seen this guy. Her guy was not wearing a cowboy hat, that was the only difference in our descriptions though. And that was the beginning. Our city now had a serial rapist and it took them years to finally catch him. In the end too, it was actually his wife that figured out it was her husband and turned him in. That was a really scary time too and the women were terrified to be out alone after dark. At our mall and I imagine at the others as well, no one was allowed to leave alone. The mall parking lot was now lit up 360 and they had security on site making sure that we were all safe. We also started a chain call between the stores to let one another know if you saw anyone that made you suspicious or frightened so that everyone would be on guard. I must admit though that I've always felt a little bit guilty for that woman being attacked like that. I mean, maybe I could have done something if I had spoken up earlier. During this time, I was going to grad school in Texas and visiting my family in Kansas City. I had just finished my visit and was driving back to Texas. I had started my drive and about an hour in, unfortunately, I got a flat tire. I called my dad and he told me to call roadside assistance and that he would be there with the AAA card as soon as he could. He got there, roadside assistance put my spare on, and we went off to the nearest Walmart to get my tires replaced. The nearest Walmart was about 20 miles away as we were in a pretty rural part of Kansas. I was following my dad, driving about 55 miles per hour since I was on a spare. There weren't a lot of cars on the highway, 
but basically just me and my dad. My dad was actually a little bit ahead of me, so I don't think that it was apparent that I was following him. But somewhere along the drive, I noticed a, a dark-colored SUV behind me. He was flashing his lights at me, swerving onto the shoulder and then back into his lane, accelerating so that he was really close to my car, and then he would fall back a bit. From the time that I noticed him, he did this for about four or five miles, which is a really long time when you're in that moment. I was about to call my dad because I felt like this was incredibly strange and very dangerous. Like I said, it was a pretty rural area and there were no cars around. If this guy was upset that I was driving slowly, he could have just gotten into the left lane and passed me, but he continued to flash his lights, tailgate me, and swerve onto the shoulder again. At this point, my dad saw what was happening, took an exit, and parked on the shoulder of the exit. I followed. The exit was not the one that we needed to take. It was a rural exit onto a gravel road, and I don't think it's used very frequently. And lo and behold, the guy followed me as well. I pulled him behind my dad, who was already out of his car with his arms in the air, saying, What the hell? At this point, I think the guy finally realized that I wasn't truly alone. He uh, slowed down a bit, looked at both of us, and hesitated for a second, and then he just took a hard left onto the gravel road and took off. At this point, I thought about trying to get his license plate, but it was a bit too late for that. The dust from the gravel road made it pretty much impossible to see his license plate anyway. I still kind of kick myself for not looking at his license plate sooner. But anyway, it was a situation that just really frightened me. We did call the police to report it, but there really wasn't much that they could do since, well, we didn't have any license plate number or any identification. However, I did learn that if I'm ever in this situation again, that I should call Highway Patrol and not 911. Apparently, when you're on the highway, you travel through so many jurisdictions that it's better to just call Highway Patrol directly. Maybe it's common sense, but it wasn't something that I'd thought about before. But ever since that day, I've always had the number for Highway Patrol on my phone, just in case I ever need to use it. In the end, nothing really happened, and I'm grateful for that, but I'm sure glad that my dad was there that day, because if he wasn't, I don't know what would have happened. This happened in uh, 2016 and this is the first time that I've ever spoken publicly about it. I also can't confirm what it was definitely. I always try to squash paranormal experiences with science and logic and stuff so I'll understand if you don't believe it. But I just can't explain this one. And based on the circumstances I, I think it was a gin or something else supernatural. And yes, I know it's possible that I did this to myself somehow, but why have I never done it before or again since? It's just really strange. So, I've been looking up a lot of videos on jinns and stuff lately. The Islamic term for genie or demon kind of. And it's primarily about military folks that have experienced things. And I've always been fascinated with these creatures, ever since I, unfortunately, think I encountered one. For context, I'm American and first became exposed to the concept of jinns after living abroad in Muslim societies. I'm non-Muslim and non-religious, for your interest, but I thought that I would add that. But the most profound exposure was when I first went to Kashmir. I was invited by a friend and was staying at a home. If you don't know the history of Kashmir, then you should probably know that it's the most militarized zone in the world and has had a lot of bloodshed over the years. As beautiful as it is, it's also just very eerie as a result. I don't really know how to describe it either, other than being very creepy at night with just lots of weird sounds. Outside the city and being in the Himalayas, there's lots of woodlands where the jinn supposedly prefer to live. Anyway... Uh, while staying with my friend, I noticed things would happen to me at night. Like, my legs or arms would randomly be pulled. I thought maybe I was just sort of jolting myself awake at first, but 
It happened multiple times each night and was really out of character for me. Then one night, I felt like I'd been choked awake. I was really shocked and sort of confused by this one. And the next morning, I finally opened up to my friend and her sister about what I'd been experiencing. They told me that because I would sleep in only underwear and a t-shirt at night, it was hot weather at the time, I was possibly attracting a djinn or their house angel, Persinder or something like that. The house angel could be jolting me awake as a way to warn me about wearing pants where I could then attract a djinn. Obviously, I was very skeptical, but I decided to wear the pants anyway, and the weird jolting, I must admit, it stopped. A few days later, we decided to visit a rural scenic area of Kashmir. My friend's cousin, my now husband, yes, I did meet him here and we fell in love, took us there. But when we entered, I just started to feel extremely ill. It's hard to describe, but I felt really lightheaded. Like, I couldn't breathe and an overwhelming sense of dread or anxiety hit me. I honestly felt like crying and I wanted to turn around. We chalked it up to the higher altitude, but I had been to other areas with an even higher altitude at this point in the previous days and had always felt fine. After sitting at a restaurant for some time though, I finally felt better and we went on exploring the mountains. So I was frolicking in the hills with my now husband and we were just kissing. The first no-no. A bit later I had to pee so I found a bush and I did my thing. For those Muslims that might be hearing this, I know. Bear in mind I didn't know anything about this stuff and my husband didn't think to warn me. Because let me tell you, you should never pee outdoors, especially in areas like this because it's very possible that you'll pee on them or their home or something and then they get angry so yeah this is where things started to go downhill i returned back to the uk where i was studying at the time a few days later i remember feeling just absolutely horrible for some reason i was vomiting and just feeling really hazy i assumed at first that it was just jet lag and went to sleep and i actually slept for like 11 hours not even waking up to pee once. When I finally woke up the next day, I hopped in the shower and my body just started to burn. Like, really burn. I was really confused as well as to why my body was burning like this, so I quickly hopped out and I looked in the mirror. And there were really deep, sort of curved, some in threes, which I've heard as an ode to the devil, scratches all over my chest, my breast, and my stomach. And man did they hurt. And were even a bit bloody as well. I later found out too. When my friend looked for me. And took some pictures. That they were also all over my back. And right above my butt. The one above my butt was one downward curve. And then two small horizontal curves inside of it. And they were in this sort of awkward place. Where I honestly don't think that I could have done it to myself. But I also didn't even have the nails to make such deep and intense scratches. I'm a very light sleeper too and I just don't know how I could have done that level of damage to myself. Anyway, I showed it to all my friends and they were all deeply disturbed and believed too that there's just no way that I could have done it to myself. I immediately told my husband to be and he told me to recite some verses from the Quran that protect you from these jinns. And it was believed that I picked up a djinn in the place that we were at and that it attached itself to one of the items that I brought from there. And, interestingly enough, the reading from the Quran seemed to stop further activity. Now, I've been to Kashmir many times since and refused to return to that place. Also, the scratches have never happened again. Of course, I sometimes scratch myself, but they're always very minimal and nothing like that. I even tried to recreate the curved scratches at one point and I just couldn't. And so, to be completely honest with you guys, I still have no idea how all those scratches got there. So this encounter took place approximately 10 years ago. I was 15 and pretty much on top of the world. Like others feel around this age too, I was absolutely invincible. 
At 15, I was a pretty big kid. I was about 6 foot and 200 pounds of strong and stupid. You'd think that I'd be a pretty terrible target, right? Well, this man didn't agree. So I was from a suburban area where my part of town was divided into a grid, approximately eight blocks long and eight blocks wide. Me and my friend Jesse were walking home from another friend's house who lives on almost the exact opposite corner of the development from me. We were on the way home and as usual I walked him to his house and then I walked to mine. We noticed a blue Ford Bronco was circling the blocks throughout our walk but didn't really think much about it. When we got to his house and we hadn't seen the truck for a few blocks, I assumed I had nothing to worry about. I get another two blocks or so and I see the truck again. He was parked on the side of the road, but you could hear that his truck was still running. He followed me all the way home, in fact, but was sure not to take the same exit route. I got to my front porch and could see that he was parked just a few houses down on the same side of the street. I mentioned it to my dad an absolute mammoth of a man, and he went out to see the truck. He saw it and started walking down to it when it just took off. Two weeks go by and I haven't seen the Bronco again. This walk home was almost a daily routine at this point. But we had a snow day from school and just me and my sister were home. I'm playing on the computer when something catches my eye. Directly to my right is a window and there's a man standing in it. Now, this window was on the first floor, but still approximately five and a half feet off the ground, by level house. This man's entire head and body still fill the window, and he's got curly hair, a full beard, and looks to be pretty fat as he fills almost the whole window. We locked eyes, and I ran out the front to confront him. Again, more brawn than brain, kind of still true to this day, in fact. But he ran off down the street to the same blue Bronco parked in almost the same spot as the last time. He pulled off faster than I could catch him, and this time, I called the cops. I gave them as much information as I could, and basically all they said was that they'd keep an eye out for him, and that's all they could do. I showed them where he was, and they were able to confirm it by the footprints in the snow leading to and away from the window. Now, what had made me a bit concerned, though, was I wore a size 12 shoe. My dad, who was still significantly larger than me at this point, wore a 14, and his shoes were still a bit smaller than the imprints in the snow. A few weeks go by and there hasn't been any more weird encounters. My head's been on a swivel every time that I'm out of the house though, I'll admit. I don't want to say that I was looking for a problem at this point, but quite honestly, uh, I was. I was kind of hoping that this dude would show up and try something. I thought that I was ready for it. I wasn't though. Me and Jesse were walking home from the same friend's house one night and we saw this Bronco again. And screw it, I thought. We're two young, fit and stupid dudes, so we figured that we're going to go and trap him. We went completely out of our way to go to the only dead end in the development to try and get him once we confirmed that he was following us. You'd never know it was a dead end too unless you knew the area because there were never, and still aren't, any dead ends or no outlet signs. I guess that he had no idea what we were doing too because he knew where we both lived and he didn't follow us down. We thought that it was a perfect plan because of how many moves that he would have to make to turn around. Several cars were parked in the street and it's not a cul-de-sac, just a road with no outlet. And we thought that we could run up on him when he tried to back out. But he outsmarted us that day, I'll admit. The next day on the same trip from the same friend's house on the same road, we see him again. I walk my friend home and I figure, screw it. I'm fine and I dare this dude to come out to me. And he didn't. This happened several more times over the next week or two until the guy decided to make his move. So I was on my way home after just leaving Jesse at his house. I got another block before I saw the truck and... I'm walking perpendicular to his truck when, as soon as I'm in his path, he turns on his lights. At this point, I ran up the few blocks to my house and waited on the porch to see where he was and what he was doing. This time, he stayed put, just a few houses down. I told my dad again and he went out to see. The truck's still there and so, me and my dad start walking down to the truck. It's still not moving. This ballsy guy has the audacity to get out of his truck to confront us too. 
terrible idea, I thought. He gets out when my dad is still 25 feet from the truck. And this guy is absolutely enormous. I guess my dad is about 6'4", right under 300 pounds with a body built like Bud Light and Manor Labor. He's a solid, don't mess with that dude, but this guy still had size on him. What I saw next was one of the most impressive things that I've ever seen in my life. So my dad's not much of a talker, and at this point he's already got a problem with this guy. The guy gets out of his truck with the most sadistic smile on his face, and my first thought was that this guy, he must have a gun. I yelled to my dad that he might have one, and all he yelled back was, I got this. And well, long story short, he definitely had it. They walked up to each other, and before a word was even said, my dad just swung. Now, you can tell when somebody is out after they've been hit, and this dude, he was completely gone. Before he even started to crumble, my dad hit him again. He hit his truck, and then he hit the ground. I can tell you that whoever said that the bigger they are, the harder they fall, was absolutely correct. I never did see the guy again after this, and after just moving back into my parents' old house with my young son, I really hope that I never do. The cops were called too, but by the time that they got there, this guy was gone, which means that, unfortunately, he was never caught.